60 minutes. Rewind. Have you ever wondered if all those people you see staring intently at their smartphones nearly everywhere and at all times are addicted to them? According to a former Google product manager you're about to hear from, Silicon Valley is engineering your phone, apps, and social media to get you hooked. He's one of the few tech insiders to publicly acknowledge that the companies responsible for programming your phones are working hard to get you and your family to feel the need to check in constantly. Some programmers call it brain hacking, and the tech world would probably prefer you didn't hear about it. But Tristan Harris openly questions the long-term consequences of it all, and we think it's worth putting down your phone to listen. This thing is a slot machine. How is that a slot machine? Well, every time I check my phone, I'm playing the slot machine to see what did I get. This is one way to um, hijack people's minds and create a habit, for, to form a habit. What you do is you make it so when someone pulls a lever, sometimes they get a reward, an exciting reward. And it turns out that this design technique can be embedded inside of all these products. So the rewards Harris is talking about are a sideways. big part of what makes smartphones so appealing. The chance of getting likes on Facebook and Instagram, cute emojis and text messages, and new followers on Twitter. There's a whole playbook of techniques that get used to get you using for the product for as long as possible. Yeah, what, what, are, what kind of techniques are used? So Snapchat's the most popular uh, messaging service for teenagers, and they invented this feature called Streaks, which shows the number of days in a row that you've sent a message back and forth with someone. So now you can say, well, what's the big deal here? Well, the problem is that kids feel like, well, now I don't want to lose my streak. But it turns out that kids actually, when they go on vacation, are so stressed about their streak that they actually give their password to like five other kids to keep their streaks going on their behalf. And so you could ask, when, when these features are being designed, are they designed to most help people live their life? Or are they being designed because they're best at hooking people into using the product? Is, is Silicon Valley programming apps or are they programming people? Inadvertently, whether they want to or not, they're shaping the thoughts and feelings and actions of, of people. They are programming people. They, there's always this narrative that technology is neutral and it's up to us to choose how we use it. This is just not true. Technology is not neutral. It's not neutral. They want you to use it in particular ways and for long periods of time because that's how they make their money. It's rare for a tech insider to be so blunt. That Tristan Harris believes someone needs to be. A few years ago, he was living the Silicon Valley dream. He dropped out of a master's program at Stanford University to start a software company. Four years later, Google bought him out and hired him as a product manager. It was while working there he started to feel overwhelmed. Honestly, I was just bombarded in email and calendar invitations and just the overload of what it's like to work a place like Google. I was asking, when is all of this adding up to like an actual benefit to my life? And I ended up making this presentation. It was kind of a manifesto. And it basically said, you know, look, never before in history have a handful of people at a handful of technology companies shaped how a billion people think and feel every day with the choices they make about these screens. His 144-page presentation argued that the constant distractions of apps and emails are weakening our relationships to each other and destroying our kids' ability to focus. It was widely read inside Google and caught the eye of one of the founders, Larry Page. But Harris told us it didn't lead to any changes, and after three years, he quit. And it's not because anyone is evil or has bad intentions, it's because the game is getting attention at all costs. And the problem is it becomes this race to the bottom of the brainstem, where if I go lower on the brainstem to get you, you know, using my product, I win, but it doesn't end up in the world we want to live in. We don't end up feeling good about how we're using all this stuff. You, you call this a race to the bottom of the brainstem. It's a race to the most primitive emotions we have, fear, anxiety, loneliness, yeah. all these things. Absolutely, and that, that's again because in the race for attention, I have to do whatever works. It absolutely wants one thing, which is your attention. Now he travels the country trying to convince programmers and anyone else who will listen that the business model of tech companies needs to change. He wants products designed to make the best use of our time, not just grab our attention. 
Do you think parents understand the, the complexities of what their kids are dealing with when they're dealing with their, their phone, dealing with apps and social media? No, and I think this is really important um, because there's a narrative that, oh, I guess they're just doing this like we used to gossip on the phone. But what this misses is that your telephone in the 1970s didn't have a thousand engineers on the other side of the telephone who were redesigning it to work with other telephones and then updating the way your telephone worked every day to be more and more persuasive. That was not true in the 1970s. How many Silicon Valley insiders are there speaking out like you are? Not that many. We reached out to the biggest tech firms, but none would speak on the record, and some didn't even return our phone call. Most tech companies say their priority is improving user experience, something they call engagement, but they remain secretive about what they do to keep people glued to their screens. So we went to Venice, California, where the bodybuilders on the beach are being muscled out by small companies that specialize in what Ramsey Brown calls brain hacking. A computer programmer who now understands how the brain works knows how to write code that will get the brain to do certain things. Yes, it is. Ramsey Brown studied neuroscience before co-founding Dopamine Labs, a startup crammed into a garage. The company is named after the dopamine molecule in our brains that aids in the creation of desire and pleasure. Brown and his colleagues write computer code for apps used by fitness companies and financial firms. The programs are designed to provoke a neurological response. You're trying to figure out how to get people coming back. To when should I make you feel a little extra awesome to get you to come back into the app longer? The computer code he creates finds the best moments to give you one of those rewards, which have no actual value. But Brown says trigger your brain to make you want more. For example, on Instagram, he told us sometimes those likes come in a sudden rush. There's holding some of them back for you to let you know later in a big burst. Like, oh. hey, here's the 30 likes we didn't mention from a little while ago. So all of a sudden why you get a big moment? burst of likes. Yeah, but why that moment? There's some algorithm somewhere that predicted, hey, for this user right now, who's experimental subject 79B3 in experiment 231, we think we can see an improvement in his behavior if you give it to him in this, bit, in this burst instead of that burst. When Brown says experiments, he's talking generally about the millions of computer calculations being used every moment by his company and others to constantly tweak your online experience and make you come back for more. You're a part of a controlled set of experiments that are happening in real time across you and millions of other people. We're guinea pigs. You're guinea pigs. You're guinea pigs in the box, pushing the button and sometimes getting the likes. And they're doing this to keep you in there. The longer we look at our screens, the more data companies collect about us and the more ads we see. Ad spending on social media has doubled in just two years to more than $31 billion. You don't pay for Facebook. Advertisers pay for Facebook. You get to use it for free because your eyeballs are what's being sold there. So That's an interesting way to look at that, that you're not the customer for Facebook. You're not the customer. You don't sign a check to Facebook, but Coca-Cola does. Brown says there's a reason texts and Facebook use a continuous scroll, because it's a proven way to keep you searching longer. You spend half your time on Facebook just scrolling to find one good piece worth looking at. It's happening because they are engineered to become addictive. You're almost saying like there's an addiction code. Yeah, that is the case. The, you, since we've figured out to some extent how these pieces of the brain that handle addiction are working, people have figured out how to juice them further and how to bake that information into apps. Dinner table could be a technology-free zone. While Brown is tapping into the power of dopamine, psychologist Larry Rosen and his team at California State University Dominguez Hills are researching the effect technology has on our anxiety levels. We're looking at the impact of technology through the brain. Rosen told us when you put your phone down, your brain signals your adrenal gland to produce a burst of a hormone called cortisol, which has an evolutionary purpose. Cortisol triggers a fight or flight response to danger. How does cortisol relate to a mobile device, a phone? What we find is the typical person checks their phone every 15 minutes or less, and half of the time they check their phone, there's no alert, no notification. It's coming from inside their head telling them, gee, I haven't checked in Facebook in a while. I haven't checked on this Twitter feed for a while. I wonder if somebody commented on my Instagram post. That then generates cortisol, and it starts to make you anxious, and eventually your goal is to get rid of that anxiety, so you check in. So the same hormone that made primitive man anxious and hyper-aware of his surroundings to keep him from being eaten by lions 
is today compelling Rosen students and all of us to continually peek at our phones to relieve our anxiety. When you put the phone down, you don't shut off your brain. You just put the phone down. Can I be honest with you right now? I haven't paid attention to what you're saying because I just realized my phone is right down by my right foot and I haven't checked it in like 10 minutes. And it and makes you anxious. I'm a little anxious. Yes. We found out just how anxious in this experiment conducted by Rosen's research colleague, Nancy Cheever. So the first thing I'm gonna do is apply these electrodes to your fingers. While I watched a video, a computer tracked minute changes in my heart rate and perspiration. What I didn't know was that Cheever was sending text messages to my phone, which was just out of reach. Every time a text notification went off, the blue line spiked, indicating anxiety caused in part by the release of cortisol. Oh, that one is, yeah, that's a huge spike right that's there. Right here. And if you can imagine what that's doing to your body, mm -hmm. every time you get a text message, you, you probably can't even feel it, right? right. Because it's, it's such a, um, it's a small amount of, of arousal. That's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Their research suggests our phones are keeping us in a continual state of anxiety in which the only antidote is the phone. Is it known what the impact of all this technology use is? Absolutely not. It's we're all too part soon. Of this, we're all part of this big experiment. What is this doing to a young mind, a teenager? Well, there are some projects going on where they're, they're actually scanning teenagers' brains over a 20-year period and looking to see what kind of changes they're finding. The story will continue after this. Here's the reality. Corporations and creators of content have, since the beginning of time, wanted to make their content as engaging as possible. Gabe Zickerman has worked with dozens of companies, including Apple and CBS, to make their online products more irresistible. He's best known in Silicon Valley for his expertise in something called gamification, using techniques from video games to insert fun and competition into almost everything on your smartphone. So one of the interesting things about gamification and other engaging technologies is at the same time as we can argue that the neuroscience is being used to create dependent behavior, those same techniques are being used to get people to work out, you know, using their Fitbit. So all of these technologies, all of the techniques for engagement can be used for good or can be used for bad. Zickerman is now working on software called Onward, designed to break users' bad habits. It'll track a person's activity and can recommend they do something else when they're spending too much time online. I think creators have to be liberated to make their content as good as possible. They sh they the, idea that, the idea that a tech company is not going to try to make their product as persuasive, as engaging as possible, you're just saying that's, that's not going to happen. Asking tech companies, asking content creators to be less good at what they do feels like a ridiculous ask. It feels impossible. And also, it's very anti-capitalistic. This isn't the system that we live in. Ramsey Brown and his garage startup Dopamine Labs made a habit-breaking app as well. It's called Space, and it creates a 12-second delay, what Brown calls a moment of zen before any social media app launches. In January, he tried to convince Apple to sell it in their App Store. And they rejected it from the App Store because they told us any app that would encourage people to use other apps or their iPhone less was unacceptable for distribution in the App Store. They actually said that to you? They said that to us. They did not want us to give out this thing that was going to make people less stuck on their phones. 